Bonsoir. Je m'appelle Claudette Tardif. Je suis présidente du Comité des langues officielles. Et au nom du comité, il me fait grand plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue. Ce soir, nous continuons notre étude sur euh, la modernisation de la loi sur les langues officielles. Nous commençons avec euh, la perspective jeunesse. Nous recevons ce soir trois jeunes étudiants qui ont été euh, référés par Canadian Parents for French et nous avons la directrice générale de Canadian Parents for French, Mme Nicole Thibault, qui est avec nous ce soir. Alors, que, comme vous le savez bien, euh, Canadian Parents for French est un organisme qui fait la promotion euh, du français langue seconde auprès des jeunes Canadiens et Canadiennes et qui encourage l'apprentissage du français. Alors, avant d'entendre de, nos témoins, j'aimerais demander au sénateur de se présenter, en commençant à ma gauche, s'il vous plaît. Sénateur Gislain Maltais du Québec, bienvenue. Bonjour, René Cormier du Nouveau-Brunswick. Bonjour. Joan Fraser, du Québec. Lynn Beat, du Ontario. Welcome. Raymond Gagné, je suis du Manitoba. Et je suis Pat Boldy, du Manitoba. Alors, Mme Thibault, vous allez commencer et ensuite, je crois que les jeunes étudiants, on aura la chance de les entendre et par la suite, les sénateurs poseront des questions. Alors, Mme Thibault, la parole est à vous. Merci. Thank you very much for receiving us. Yes, I'm not one of the youth, so I get to speak first, but just quickly to introduce them. Uh, Canadian Parents for French, as uh, Senator Terdif mentioned, represents 26,000 members across Canada, and they're mostly parents. Not all parents, but mostly parents. And really, our focus is about looking for research-informed volunteer organization. How do we promote and create opportunities to learn French, but also to use French? And so traditionally, we may have done work within the schools, We do continue to do that, mais de plus en plus, we try to make sure that there's opportunities outside of school. Alors, les, les, les interactions avec les francophones sont très, très importantes pour nous. Uh, that opportunity for a francophile to actually use their language and to speak with a native speaker and to feel that confidence build makes a big difference. Um, so we've been around since 1977, so we are celebrating our 40th anniversary, and we were started by Keith Spicer, Canada's first First Commissioner of Official Languages, who brought together 30 parents, and now, 40 years later, we're 26,000 parents. So it does say how the demand and the popularity of, of groups, programs like French Immersion has really changed the landscape of education for Anglophones in Canada and having these opportunities. We were the recipient of the Commissioner's Award of uh, Excellence for Promotion of Linguistic Duality in 2016, and they just released the report, and I'm so please, no, there's no new recipient, so we're going to continue saying we're the last recipient. Um, our vision is really seeing linguistic and du uh, cultural duality as an integral part of daily life in Canada, and we really want to talk about our strategic priorities. Our number one priority is youth. That really is our number one pillar. And so for us, when you invited us and asked if our youth could speak, that was a wonderful opportunity because we really think that's where we make the biggest difference. Our principal youth event is Le Concours d'Art Aratoire, which is a French public speaking contest. It is the largest en français, and that's because we've estimated that we hit 63,000 students each year. And that means that a student is participating in their class, in their school, then they may go to the school district competition, and then if those then move forward, go to the province or territorial branch events, and then they may end up and find themselves at the finals at the national capital every year. We've been doing that for 15 years. And so with me today are three students who've participated in the Canadian Parents for French Concours d'Aratoire as one of those out-of-school experiences that they've been able to use in their French second language. I do want to also say that our goals are also to support parents. As you can imagine, there's a lot of hurdles to get across when you're an Anglophone who doesn't speak French in Canada. How do I make sure my child has access to French programs? I also, you know, as a parent, want to make sure they're effective programs. How do I know the level of French that they will graduate with? How do I know where they can go and pursue post-secondary education en français? So for a lot of English parents, those are the hurdles that we try to work with them to make sure that the best opportunities are available for their kids. 
Um, we follow the work that you do very closely. We are probably the biggest fan of the report called Aiming Higher. Uh, we have it flagged and t t tagged and we show it and we quote it and we, we bring it everywhere because it's the tools that you create like this really do help us with the stakeholders that we work with. So we have, you know, highlight some of those recommendations and probably the biggest thing for us with our youth is the part around rapprochement and appreciation. It's how do we increase interaction opportunities to enhance and sustain bilingualism in Canadian society. That's one of our biggest challenges. The students will tell you a little bit more about their, their, their successes and their challenges. And then finally, we just wanted to state that we are very um, supportive and value strategic partnerships. And so we are a founding organization of the French Second Language Education Partner Network. So we work with the immersion teachers, we work with the second language teachers, we work with the two groups that I think you've met last week, French for the Future and Experience Canada. Um, so as a, a group, we're able to have a stronger voice for French as a second language. Uh, we also signed a protocol of collaboration with l'Association des Collèges et Universités de la Francophonie canadienne. Et c'est important pour nous parce que souvent, c'est les francophiles qui vont aller aux institutions postsecondaires francophones. Et d'avoir une structure, une base, un mentorat, euh, des, des, des programmes en place pour les aider pour la réussite dans ces, ces institutions sont très importantes. Alors, on sait qu'il y a beaucoup de groupes qui pensent que c'est C est, c est, ils vont ouvrir leurs portes, mais il faut quand même une structure de, de base pour les aider à réussir. And then finally, it's just to say that, uh, you know, we continue with our work, and as you move forward, we're here to help. And if there's any help on research or things like that, we've often talked to your staffs. Um, we do have services that we help with the public, with statistics, letting people know the enrollment, how it's changing in different provinces, and we'd be more than happy to be helpful if we can be. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame Thibault. Alors, uh, réellement, uh, ce prix est bien mérité. Le prix que vous avez reçu du commissaire aux langues officielles, c'est très mérité parce que vos organismes fait un travail uh, étonnant et, et surtout important pour notre société. Alors, uh, avant de, de demander aux étudiants de, de, de témoigner, j'aimerais vous présenter deux sénatrices qui, qui sont arrivées. Uh, Marie-Françoise Mégis, Montréal, Québec. Lucie Monsieur, Ontario. Merci. Alors, je crois que qui va commencer? Nous avons Austin Henderson, Christina Andronic et Lucie Asante. C'est Austin, n'est-ce pas? Merci. Good afternoon, Ms. Chair, and to the other honorable members of this committee. J'aimerais vous remercier pour nous avoir invités pour être partie de cette conversation importante. My name is Austin Henderson and I am a born and raised New Brunswicker. In fact, I graduated from New Brunswick's early French immersion program from a school in a rural village with approximately 2,000 people. New Brunswick is Canada's only bilingual province. Nonetheless, we continue to face adversity when it comes to the integration of both official languages. En étant un jeune Néo-Brunswickois, venant d'une famille et d'une région qui est pour la plupart unilingue, je suis fier de ma deuxième langue. Mais je reconnais qu'il y a du travail à faire. I was extremely fortunate to develop a passion for bilingualism from a young age. This passion, however, was not possible without being enabled and triggered by organizations and teachers. This is why both of these stakeholders are instrumental in the enforcement of the Official Languages Act. De la sixième année jusqu'à la douzième année, j'ai participé au concours d'art oratoire de Canadian Parents for French au niveau régional ainsi que provincial. L'an dernier, j'ai eu l'occasion de participer au concours au niveau national. In 2014, I was able to travel to France for an immersive experience to enhance, embrace, and improve my second language. More recently, I was named the Vice President for the Canadian Parents for French New Brunswick Board of Directors. Mes expériences avec l'organisation Canadian Parents for French ainsi que mes expériences à l'étranger m'ont permis de travailler à améliorer ma langue seconde hors d'une salle de classe. Malgré mon inscription dans la programme d'immersion, j'étais seulement inscrit dans cinq cours de français dans mes deux dernières années à l'école, deux auxquels devaient être complétés en ligne grâce au choix limité à mon école rurale. 
Now, after completing my first year of university, I have yet to be able to take a class in my second language. My bilingual abilities, like many of the French immersion students across the country, are in jeopardy due to the fact that we are not provided with enough opportunities, especially after graduating, to enhance our French and English second language skills. Even in the only bilingual province, we face adversity when getting the access to the required tools. This is why input from young Canadians is so important. In New Brunswick, I would be wrong to say that there is not still some sort of divide between the Anglophones and the Francophones, but I truly believe that this is not necessarily the case amongst the young Canadians. We want to learn French, we want the opportunities, and we want our country to become bilingual. We see the long-term benefits of bilingualism and are very quick to jump through the doors that bilingualism opens for us. En tant que recommandation, je, je suggère d'assurer que les jeunes sont inclus dans ce processus. Par contre, je suggère aussi d'assurer que c'est non seulement les jeunes bilingues comme nous qui recevons cette occasion de témoigner, mais aussi ceux qui n'ont pas eu le privilège d'apprendre leur langue seconde. In terms of recommendations for my specific experiences in New Brunswick, it will be that the federal government work closer with provincial governments to ensure that Canada does in fact provide equal and efficient bilingual services. In doing so, and in normalizing the provision of all services in both official languages, I believe that more young people will embrace our linguistic duality. For instance, subject, subsection B of the purpose of this act is to support the development of English and French linguistic minority communities. In my province, these communities are typically rural and do not necessarily embrace the presence of their linguistic counterparts. In section 7, the advancement of English and French, section 41B, it discusses fostering full recognition and use of both official languages in Canadian society. In order for this to be realistic, the federal government must recognize that the reality is that learning this second language is often a privilege. These services must be offered to all Canadians, regardless of race, location, ethnicity, age, employment, etc. This includes second language job training, job opportunities, etc. In fact, I share the position of Canadian Parents for French in advocating that learning French and English as a second language should be considered a right as Canadians in a country that is supposed to be bilingual. Pour s'assurer que la section subventionnée soit bien exécutée, le gouvernement fédéral doit reconnaître l'importance de l'apprentissage par expérience dans le processus d'apprendre une langue seconde. L'avancement d'un pays et de son bilinguisme se repose sur les générations d'aujourd'hui. Et pour s'assurer que cela ait du succès, on doit avoir l'occasion de participer dans des expériences hors de la salle de classe. In addition, in section 18 of part 3, the administration of justice, the act writes that judicial proceedings will only be executed in the official language of choice if the crown is a party. Therefore, for instance, if a family in British Columbia were to request divorce proceedings in French, there is no obligation for the British Columbian government to provide these services. Whereas New Brunswick has its own official language act, this would be a right and therefore proves that the services in our country are not uniform from province to province. In modernizing this legislation in honor of our country's 150th, we have an opportunity to improve our official languages and their services. Canadians cannot be passionate about both official languages if they do not have the opportunity to learn them. And they cannot have the opportunity to learn them without the support of the federal government and its partnership with each and every province. Nous ne pouvions pas considérer le Canada comme un pays bilingue si chaque citoyen ne reçoit pas la même occasion pour apprendre nos deux langues, ainsi que si notre pays et nos provinces continuent à vivre des expériences séparées basées sur nos deux langues. The solution to this is to allow everyone to learn French and English as second languages and to, in fact, become what is actually a bilingual country. De nouveau, je vous remercie pour nous avoir invités et j'ai hâte, hâte à répondre à vos questions. Un grand merci, Austin. Christina? Bonjour à tous, Madame la, la Présidente et les membres du comité. J'aimerais vous remercier de cette occasion de m'exprimer aujourd'hui concernant les langues officielles. Je m'appelle Christine Andronic et je viens d'Ottawa. Je suis ici afin de représenter Canadian Parents for French, qui est une organisation dont la mission est de promouvoir le français parmi les jeunes Canadiens et Canadiennes. J'étais inscrite au programme d'immersion française de quatrième année jusqu'à douzième année. Cependant, due to the lack of resources available in elementary schools and high schools, my high school did not have a well-developed French immersion program, and by grade 12, I was only taking one course in French. French. Um, de 9e année jusqu'à 11e année, j'ai participé au concours d'art oratoire organisé par Canadian Parents for French. Je me suis qualifiée pour les compétitions provinciales où j'ai gagné première place en trois années consécutives. 
tous les gagnants provinciaux en 11e et 12e année ont, ont l'opportunité de participer au niveau national. The national level competition is an absolutely incredible and unforgettable experience. To see youth ga gathered from all across Canada, passionate about French and bilingualism is inspiring. We talked about facing adversity, learning the French language. We talked about extracurricular activities involving French, and it was an amazing opportunity to bring everyone together and to see how far reaching French is across Canada and how many people it affects. J'ai gagné le concours d'art oratoire national et j'ai reçu la bourse de CPF, ce qui m'a inspiré further de continuer mon aventure avec cette belle langue et poursuivre, poursuivre mes études à l'Université d'Ottawa. For the past three years, I've been at the University of Ottawa in the extended French stream, taking courses both in English and in French. And the opportunities at the University of Ottawa are incredible. I have not had any difficulty registering for courses in French. There are many clubs available to Anglophones who want to practice their oral French, and I've been very surprised and happy with how available this is to students. However, when I changed programs from biomedical science to a brand new program called translational and molecular medicine, I noticed there were more problems. For example, the French program was not developed well, and yes, this is because the program is in its first year, but we did face challenges such as francophone professors telling French students don't study science in English, sorry, in French, because the language of science is English. And this was very difficult to hear because you don't want to be told that the language that you want to learn in isn't the right language. So we're working with helping translational and molecular medicine improve this. We've spoken to the board of directors for TMM, which is the abbreviation of this program, and they are working to put in place a stronger French program for incoming students. Um, this year, I was offered um, a letter, an, I was offered admission at the Faculty of Medicine for the University of Ottawa for the MD program. And it is very incredible that the University of Ottawa is the only university in all of North America that offers the N MD program in both official languages. But I'm very excited to start, to start my medical training, to interact with patients in French and in English. I believe that speaking to people in their language of choice leads to stronger relationships, more trust, and I'm looking forward to this. It is also, I'm very happy that French has helped me with other languages that I'm trying to learn. It's helped me with my mother tongue, which is Romanian, and it's helped me learn my fourth language, Spanish. Um, other than school, I've been or, uh, volunteering with CPF, and one very memorable event is the Sir Wilfrid Laurier event, where again, youth from across Canada were gathered, and we celebrated Sir Wilfrid Laurier and his efforts to make French equal with English in Canada. And it was incredible learning about Canadian history. And we had a talk from an MP named Peter Schiefke, and I found it incredible that all of the major milestones in his life were achievable because he was able to speak both of Canada's official languages. And this inspired me to continue French throughout my life. And finally, Again, completely outside school, I've been very fortunate to be able to travel to Europe almost every year with my family. And I do notice that learning French or having learned French has helped me so much in my travels. I get to interact with the locals and you just, you appreciate the culture more, you appreciate the customs and it's an incredible experience, for example, in countries such as France, France Switzerland and Belgium. Et aussi en 2011, j'ai voyagé avec mon équipe gymnastique pour être participant dans the World Gymnastrata, which is an event where gymnasts from all across the world gather in a city to showcase their love and talent in gymnastics. And everyone there spoke soit l'anglais, soit français. So knowing both languages, I was able to talk to everybody and it made the experience that much better. So je, me, je vous remercie et je répondrai à vos questions bientôt. Merci. Merci, Christina. Tu sais? Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je m'appelle Lucie Santé, une étudiante qui entre dans sa quatrième année à l'Université d'Ottawa. Et je me considère comme un individu anglophone avec une compétence professionnelle limitée dans la langue française. Même si je suis née au Canada, je viens d'un uh, milieu africain et uh, je m'associe grandement avec ma, mon identité um, africaine. Ma famille s'est établie à Winnipeg et ma mère, um, une réfugiée congolaise, ma, me raconte les défis de l'intégration dans la société canadienne. Pour elle, la difficulté euh, de s'appartenir à une communauté minoritaire faisait une grande partie des limitations linguistiques par rapport à l'éducation, à l'emploi et la qualité de vie en général. 
Elle voulait que ses enfants soient multilingues et c'était pour ça qu'elle a décidé de m'enregistrer dans des cours d'immersion en école secondaire. Peu avant cette décision, je suivais le curriculum de français de base du Manitoba. Ce curriculum dépend excessivement de la structure de la, de la langue, donc mon français à l'écrit avait bien développé, mais j'avais du, uh, du mal encore à m'exprimer à l'oral. It was in the ninth grade that I began participating in school-based and provincial oratory um, art competitions, and although nerve-wracking, it was the first time I had been given the opportunity to practice my uh, French-speaking skills. I found myself uh, facing many of the same limitations as my secondary school colleagues. Although we had been given all of the tools to advance ourselves in our second language, or maybe third language, the frequency in which we were given the opportunity to actualize these skills were far and few in, uh, between. The basic French program in Manitoba Manitoba today seems to adhere to an unbalanced liter literacy-based um, approach to French language learning. Throughout my experience in the classroom, our studies focus primarily on the learning of complex uh, sentence structures and obsolete verb tenses. So despite many of us becoming uh, proficient in the written art, our ability to speak in a leisurely conversation um, with relative ease and fluidity um, suffered greatly. Avec Canadian Parents for French, j'avais donné l'opportunité de participer au concours national et je me trouve aujourd'hui dans le capital national et en poursuivant mes études à universitaires à l'Université d'Ottawa. Au niveau supérieur, il y a plusieurs de nous qui subissent des difficultés de nouveau, mais grâce aux établissements um, au campus, tels que le Centre d'aide à la rédaction à des travaux universitaires et l'implication de certaines um, régulations académiques, on est offert une multitude de ressources qui aident au succès académique. De plus, tout étudiant a le droit de rédiger, de rédiger ses travaux et de répondre aux questions d'examen, soit en anglais, soit en français, un aspect très utile pour ceux qui ont des difficultés avec la langue. The modernization of the Official Languages Act is an important update as it should reflect Canada's diverse populations across the nation. Today, we focus heavily on duality. However, we need not forget the many languages that are becoming of significant, significant importance in this country. I spoke earlier about the linguistic limitations faced by my mother. However, because the Democratic Republic of the Congo is widely French-speaking, she still had access to many services in French and was able to communicate using French, despite Winnipeg's relatively small Francophone community. A trip to Toronto last summer gave me a new perspective of Canada's cultural and linguistic diversity and how it is changing. Standing in line at a bank in downtown Toronto, I noticed that services were offered in English and in Mandarin, concurrent with the specific needs of the growing Asian populations of the area. Selon moi, il faut reconnaître non seulement le patrimoine du bilinguisme, mais aussi il faut que cette modernisation soit une représentation de cette nouvelle identité canadienne. Plusieurs immigrants constituent des uh, portions significatives de, de nos communautés, et dans le cas comme celui de Toronto, il est nécessaire d'accommoder les besoins des régions spécifiques. I hope to see not only greater push in French language instruction pertaining to oral communication, but as well a more inclusive approach uh, to French languages used by minority groups across Canada to accommodate the changing ling linguistic identity of this, uh, of this country. Je suis honorée de faire partie de cette conversation aujourd'hui et j'ai hâte de, vous, de voir toutes les implications renouvelées qui vont se réaliser au proche, uh, future proche. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Alors, merci encore une fois pour uh, vos témoignages. Vous êtes... Uh, de jeunes professionnels euh, remarquables. Euh, je l'ai dit la semaine dernière aussi, lorsque nous avions eu un groupe de jeunes euh, étudiants et étudiantes. Et euh, on voit que euh, vos parents euh, doivent être très fiers, vos enseignants, Canadian Parents for French, uh, you've done very well. Uh, these are remarkable young professionals, and uh, I want to commend each of you on the personal initiatives that you have taken uh, to, to move forward uh, in making French uh, uh, more of a reality for many others in, in, in your group of, uh, of uh, peers. That's very important. And Austin, I must say, I was very impressed by your knowledge of, of the Official Languages Act, citing 41D and, uh, and Part 7 of, of the Act. So that was very impressive. Thank you for that. Um, Les sénateurs ont des questions. Uh, nous allons commencer avec le sénateur Cormier, suivi de la sénatrice Bovey. Madame la Présidente, merci beaucoup pour vos, uh, vos présentations, pour vos allocutions qui sont fortes, inspirantes et qui sont même, je dirais, très émouvantes pour uh, un francophone vivant en milieu minoritaire d'entendre trois jeunes uh, anglophones nous parler de cette manière de la langue française. 
Vous avez fait une des plus belles odes à la langue française que j'ai entendues depuis longtemps, de par, par vos témoignages, par vos expériences, par vos prix. Euh, je suis assez euh, impressionné et euh, M. Anderson, vous êtes du Nouveau-Brunswick, une province que je connais bien évidemment. Vous êtes d'une région rurale anglophone et vous maîtrisez la langue française d'une telle manière que je n'ai jamais entendu personne au Nouveau-Brunswick issu d'une communauté de langue anglaise parler français comme vous le faites. Cela dit, il y a, il y a une étude qui a été produite en 2013 euh, de Jean-François Lepage et de Jean-Pierre Corbeil pour le compte de Statistique Canada qui dit que seulement 8 des anglophones au Canada et 6 des anglophones hors Québec parlent aussi le français, donc son, son, son bilingue. Selon cette même étude, ce pourcentage sera en baisse depuis 2001. Alors, j'aimerais savoir de vous, au-delà de, du travail formidable que fait Canadian Parents for French, quelles sont vos motivations vraiment profondes? Quels ont été les, les événements et les facteurs qui font que vous parlez le français et que vous décidez de continuer de le parler, particulièrement pour ceux et celles d'entre vous qui habitent des régions anglophones? Okay. Um, donc, moi, je peux commencer avec celui-là. Um, venant du Nouveau-Brunswick, uh, comme tu as mentionné, d'une région rurale qui est particulièrement anglophone. Um, donc, j'ai commencé le français en première année. C'était le choix de mes parents. Ce n'était pas ma choix. Um, mais aujourd'hui, je suis tellement content qu'ils ont fait cette décision, décision pour moi. Um, mais j'ai grandi uh, dans une ville qui n'avait pas beaucoup de personnes qui parlaient français. Donc, ça, c'était uh, même ça, une motivation um, pour devenir uh, plus bilingue, pour être par une personne qui pourrait um, essentiellement um, promouvoir le message que le bilinguisme est important. Et maintenant, des personnes peuvent, uh, peuvent voir que ça ouvre des portes um, quand, quand tu parles bilingue. Uh, aussi, il y a le fait que Um, J'ai grandi, um, et des personnes autour de moi ont dit « Le Nouveau-Brunswick est bilingue, le Canada est bilingue. » Mais j'habitais dans une région qui avait très peu de personnes qui étaient bilingues. Donc, je voulais uh, faire mon parti pour pouvoir travailler à cette réputation et encourager les autres personnes à parler français. Parce que si on a cette réputation, c'est important qu'on est réellement bilingue. Um, donc, en étant un jeune, je pense qu'on a une, uh, une voix importante, une voix qui, qui est entendue um, par les personnes qui sont dans les positions de pouvoir. Donc, ça nous donne l'opportunité de, de, de nous exprimer um, dans nos deux langues pour, pour expliquer l'importance du bilinguisme. Et éventuellement, si, si on continue à faire ça, je crois que ça va, ça va devenir uh, plus normal d'avoir des personnes bilingues. Um, C'est mes motivations, um, mais je, avec chaque initiative um, que j'ai l'opportunité à, à faire, um, je continue à recevoir des autres motiva motivations. Donc, en sixième année, j'ai commencé le concours um, et après, j'ai con continué à faire le concours du sixième jusqu'au douzième uh, année. Donc, ça continue avec chaque initiative différente, mais c'est ça les, les motivations uh, primaires. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I say something too? So, um, with respect to all languages, I, I love languages, so the more that I learn, the more fun it gets. But with French specifically, if you learn about Canadian history, it's almost impossible to not want to or to feel a sense of duty to learn the French language because many people have sacrificed their lives really to help French gain uh, the same popularity, I guess, as English. So learning Canadian history is very, it will really inspire you to learn the French language. And also being enrolled in early immersion for me, it helped me greatly and I notice in schools with students who aren't enrolled in early immer immersion they're less excited about learning French in high school if they're told to learn that so I think that the earlier you start the more it becomes part of your identity and you're proud to be able to speak in French and also again as you get older you can participate in things like concours where people are telling you you should speak in French you can speak in French and we're going to help you and it's incredible and inspiring and I think that more organizations like this are really helpful to youth in Canada. Um, I agree with Christina in the fact that learning French at an early age is ex extremely important. And for me, I didn't necessarily get the opportunity to start very young. But because of my, like I said, my Congolese identity, it was important for me to learn it and to be able to interact with my, with my grandparents and my parents and my extended family as well. So it was very important that I started as soon as possible. So yeah, I agree. <laughs> 
Petite complémentaire. Est-ce que, ma, ma question s'adresse à vous trois, en fait, mais peut-être à, à plus particulièrement à M. Anderson, est-ce que dans votre apprentissage et votre, dans, votre, votre, dans votre motivation, quelle, était, quelle est votre relation avec les, les, les Acadiens, les francophones du Nouveau-Brunswick? Est-ce que vous avez une relation constante ou c'est est occasionnel ou est-ce que c'est une source de motivation ou pas? Euh, comment vous vivez la relation euh, avec la, 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 la communauté francophone? Uh, la communauté acadien en particulier, tu veux dire? Oui. Um, donc, comme mentionné, um, la région um, d'où je viens, uh, c'est une région qui est, qui est particulièrement séparée des régions acadiennes. Uh, mais je me souviens, je dirais, uh, en cinquième année, j'étais perdu de la clé partie de la curriculum euh, en français ainsi qu'en histoire d'apprendre à propos des Acadiens. Donc, je dirais qu'au Nouveau-Brunswick, apprendre à propos de cette partie euh, importante de l'histoire encourage les jeunes à parler français, euh, au moins pour moi, euh, quand j'étais à cet âge, c'était quelque chose d'intéressant. Ça donnait une connexion personnelle parce que les Acadiens ont une, ont une histoire euh, euh, très proéminent dans notre province. Donc, ça nous permet d'avoir cette connexion, um, cette motivation de continuer. Um, mais en tant que connexion personnelle hors du curriculum d'histoire, de sciences humaines, tous ces cours à, à l'école, il n'y a pas vraiment une connexion parce que les communautés anglophones et francophones, surtout dans les régions rurales, um, au Nouveau-Brunswick, sont pas mal séparées, um, mais uh, ils sont encore dans nos curriculums, je dirais. Merci. Deuxième oui. tour, quand ça vient. D'accord. Sénatrice Bovy, s'il vous plaît. Ensuite, la sénatrice Gagné. Thank you. I'm truly inspired by uh, your dedication and your commitment and, and uh, admiring of what you've accomplished, each of you. Um, and I know it's not easy. Um, Austin, I, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a couple of questions for both of you, for, for all of you. But Austin, you mentioned um, uh, when you came through that um, got through your schooling that uh, the bilingual abilities or the opportunities to to use it weren't there so much. Do you want to talk about, I'd be interested in all your viewpoints on that and I'm going to tell you I come from a very particular place on this because many years ago I had a daughter who graduated from French immersion many years ago and has lost it and has had absolutely no opportunity to use it. So I'd like to know what you think you can do to change that um, dynamic of 20 years ago? Sure. Um, I definitely think that's uh, definitely an issue, especially in New Brunswick, where we're considered a bilingual province. Um, so like I mentioned, I went through French immersion, um, as did a lot of the people that I graduated with, and already by this time, a lot of them haven't had the opportunity to speak French at all, and are already losing it. Um, the, the main thing that I was nervous about coming here was the fact that it has been an extremely long time since I've spoken French uh, because I'm surrounded by everything in English, even when I'm in New Brunswick. Um, so it's even getting rusty, I would say, um, and I'm someone who has been involved in, in bilingual initiatives. I think that um, in order to address this issue and this sort of problem, I would say, issue, uh, is to be able to normalize the the sort of integration of both French and English. Even in a province like New Brunswick, we're considered bilingual, but the services aren't necessarily always in French and English, especially when you go into areas where I am. Um, there's sort of that notion that this is an English area, um, but we need to get away from that and sort of normalize um, French immersion when they're young, but also normalize uh, services in French once they graduate and opportunities in French once they graduate and continue to be able to provide extra services for those that can speak both languages because it is a motivation um, to do that. And you need to start young, you need to normalize the French immersion program, I would say, uh, to be able to start with the younger generation and eventually it will get better that way. Uh, but it is in the scenario that your daughter said, it is common, unfortunately. Uh, and I think that by um, having sort of an across the board normalization of services in French and also um, sort of getting away from that notion that this is an English community, this is a French community uh, and integrating them together can help address that. Christina? I would say I agree with the, that starting from an early, if, if French becomes part of your identity, you don't want to lose it. And like your daughter, I understand that when you don't get to speak French as much as you did in high school, you almost feel like you're losing part of your own identity. <laughs> and it's sad that you have to seek out opportunities to speak in French with others instead of just being able to speak freely. So it's great that there are services for people to speak in French with others if they go seek th out those opportunities, but it would be better if, if, from, like, if people learn from a young age both languages 
they'll use both freely. And I think that that would really encourage people to continue in both English and French in their adult lives. So I think that that's where the problem needs to be tackled is at a young age. Um, I agree with both my colleagues in that um, starting young is really important. Um, I find also that a lot of us are afraid to sort of express ourselves in French, especially around francophones, because we find ourselves like afraid that we're going to make a mistake or we're going to be outed that we're actually Anglo anglophone and don't speak French all the time. So it's important to sort of gain the confidence to speak French early on because the younger you start, obviously, the easier it will be as you get older. So I have one other question, if I may, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, Austin, you, you said in our consultative process that, uh, you know, I think you applauded the fact that we're meeting with youth, but uh, I thought you very uh, interestingly pointed out that perhaps we should be speaking to youth who have not been able to or have taken up the opportunity to learn the other official language. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because uh, I think that's an interesting view, because uh, not every not every student across this country has the opportunity to enroll in either English or French, which isn't their home language. I'd love to speak to that, actually. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the New Brunswick example again, if I may. Um, so I graduated from the French Immersion Program. I'm in a school that's relatively rural. Um, I say that uh, it's still sort of central enough that we did have the French Immersion Program. There are schools in our province that don't. So in a bilingual, in a bilingual province, we have schools that are further out uh, away from the cities that aren't able to have the opportunity at all. Um, in, in New Brunswick, just this upcoming fall, we'll be starting uh, French immersion back again in grade one as a grade one entry point. Uh, and there's initiatives going on to have the rural schools uh, the opportunity to, to have their French immersion classes starting in grade one as well, um, which is incredibly important. But there are, there's that gap, so starting now in grade one, but there's the, the children that are in school now that haven't had the opportunity to learn French, and then by the time they graduate, they say, oh, it's too late. Uh, so that just perpetuates the, the constant separation and the uh, sort of the, the divide between the French services, the English services, and the integration of both communities. Uh, there's also, Outside of, New outside of the province of New Brunswick, but also in New Brunswick, um, individuals who just are simply not provided any opportunity at all, just because whether that be with um, difficulties they have already in their first mother tongue lang or language of English, or whatever the case may be, there are, there are individuals who are not able to learn French. So I think it's important to consult them as well, because we have the incredible opportunity of being able to have gone through French programs and been able to participate in initiatives um, with organizations such as CPF, uh, but there's others who are not able to do that and who are not uh, at a certain level to be able to participate. So say there's the students that uh, are bilingual, participating in, in CPS concours, uh, but don't make it to the national level. They don't make these connections, then participate in other initiatives with CPF, like the Laurier Project, and all of those things. So it's important to also consult them and say, where was that divide, and where did that, where did it break down in the, in the steps to having these opportunities, and how can the Official Languages Act and the federal government, et cetera, how can they help sort of bridge that gap and improve that? I think it also has a lot to do with resources. Um, so the high school that I went to in Winnipeg, I grew up in the St. James of Sinaboya School Division, so I went to Sturgeon Heights Collegiate, which was the only high school in the entire uh, division that offered immersion courses. <laughs> so after my family moved to another area of the city, I had to basically commute to high school, which was over 45 minutes on the bus every single day just so I could um, keep up with those French um, courses and things like that. So I think it's important to increase the resources and make it more flexible for students to be able to gain access to French language learning across across the board. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, félicitations. Uh, je pense que vous sous-estimez vos compétences en langue française. Alors, je voulais juste vous dire que vous ne devez pas être et sentir insécure quand vous parlez en français, parce que vous parlez très bien. Euh, la semaine dernière aussi, j'ai demandé euh, aux jeunes qui se sont présentés euh, ici euh, de remercier euh, leurs parents d'avoir euh, pris cette décision euh, in de les inscrire au programme d'immersion. Et puis, euh, j'aimerais que vous transmettiez le même message à vos parents, parce qu'ils ont fait une, une bonne décision, malgré, euh, je pense, euh, souvent... 
le risque qu'ils prennent euh, lorsqu'ils prennent cette décision-là, surtout de vous inscrire dans une, une autre langue que la langue maternelle, euh, leur langue maternelle. Et puis, euh, je voulais vous dire aussi qu'il y a une belle sagesse chez vous que je, que je trouve moi aussi très inspirante. Si vous aviez euh, un message à transmettre au gouvernement euh, du Canada au sujet de, euh, de la promotion euh, des deux langues officielles dans la société euh, canadienne, que, quel message est-ce que vous leur lui transmettiez, transmetteriez? Austin? Je vais commencer, oui. Um, donc, je dirais um, de commencer à, à mettre um, une emphase sur les jeunes. Uh, leur service, um, toutes les choses qui sont offrées en français et en anglais, doit commencer avec les jeunes. Parce qu'on parle um, des personnes qui deviennent des adultes et ont perdu leurs habiletés de parler leur deux langues. Um, il y a plusieurs um, difficultés quand on, a, quand on atteint l'âge d'un adulte. Donc, si on commence à mettre une emphase sur les jeunes, éventuellement, les services deviendra normal. And so, in New Brunswick, specifically, again, going back to the, to the hometown thing, um, focusing um, on, on young people sort of normalizes that conversation and will address more of the issues other than just the fact that when we become adults, we'll lose it, but we'll also address the, the sort of linguistic And cultural and social divides, so that will improve uh, the situation as a whole. So I'm a big advocate for focusing focusing on the young people, and then uh, things will sort of have a domino, a positive effect. Est-ce que je peux euh, juste peut-être pour poursuivre euh, la discussion au niveau de normaliser la vie en français? Pour vous, ce que j'entends, c'est important euh, de, de normaliser. En tant que jeune, est-ce que vous croyez que quand on regarde tous les moyens de communication, est-ce qu'on met suffisamment d'emphase pour euh, euh, investir davantage dans la francisation, utiliser les médias sociaux pour justement pouvoir communiquer avec d'autres gens partout au Canada euh, dans votre langue additionnelle, dans l'autre langue officielle? Um, je pense que c'est important de normaliser non seulement le français, mais aussi l'anglais pour assurer qu'on qu normalise le bilinguisme. Parce que là, il y a des régions au Nouveau-Brunswick qui, qui sont francophones, puis ils ne norma normalisent pas l'anglais. Il y a des régions anglais qui ne normalisent pas le, le français. Et c'est comme ça tout autour du pays. Um, et en tant que médias sociaux, um, c'est presque um, une habitude de ne pas parler en français, même si nos amis tout autour du pays sont, uh, sont bilingues. Donc, si que je parlerais uh, à n'importe qui, des personnes de concours, etc., um, même si que je sais qu'ils sont uh, impliqués avec CPF, ils sont bilingues, tout ça, c'est normal de parler en anglais. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, mais c'est normal. Um, je sais um, que quelque chose qui m'a aidé beaucoup uh, en tant que médias sociaux, uh, c'était quelque chose que je faisais quand je pratiquais pour le concours, c'était d'écouter la radio en français, d'écouter la télévision en français. Donc, ça, c'est quelque chose qui, uh, qui peut aider à normaliser um, le, la conversation, le français um, conversationnel. Um, et ça, c'est quelque chose que je pense que, qui pourrait aussi aider. Et peut-être si qu'on faisait... Um, si on écoutait plus de radio en français, plus de télévision en français, ça pourrait aussi normaliser les conversations aux médias sociaux en français aussi. Um, je vais peut-être, je ne sais pas s'il y en a d'autres qui veulent commenter, ou je, je peux poser une autre question, si, si vous voulez. Est-ce que vous aimeriez commenter ou… I can comment, yeah. Oui? I think, uh, for me, it again takes it back to the identity thing. So, people want to learn French, they really do, and if we start at a young age, it it helps French become part of everyone's identity. And if it's part of your identity, and if you are proud to speak in French, you're not going to be like, oh, nobody else is doing it, I won't do it. It's going to be normal. It's going to be equal in between English and French. So I think it's so important, again, just to start at a young age, learning both languages. It, it is a sense of identity, a sense of patriotism. And I think that normalizing it, um, if, it's if you're taught to speak both languages from a really early age, it just becomes normal. It'll be normalized that way. Alors, Christina, est-ce que, est que tu es euh, optimiste face à l'avenir du bilinguisme au Canada? Si on peut euh, aider les jeunes à commencer à apprendre le français um, dès leur entrée en première année, je pense que oui, je suis optimiste, surtout si les programmes en français sont obligatoires. D'accord. Euh, aussi? Non, je suis, suis d'accord. D'accord. J'ai d'autres questions, mais je veux une deuxième ronde. Fraser, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Madame la Présidente. 
Um, yeah, you're, you're a very impressive trio. Um, it, it's, it's wonderful to hear young Anglophones who speak French as well as you do and with the enthusiasm that you have. Uh, before I put my question, I'd, I'd just like to comment on the, the notion that after all this work and all these years and all this dedication, it is possible that one might lose one's second language capacity. Um, and goodness knows we all hope that doesn't happen to anybody. But you never lose everything. Um, if, if life takes you somewhere where Spanish ends up being the language that you're actually using most of the time, um, you, may you might even lose some of your English. But you never lose the enrichment that came with the learning and the experience and the immersion, if you will, in that second language and its culture. Um, when I was your age, I spoke uh, pretty good Spanish and moderate German. Um, German's all gone. Uh, I can say Guten Morgen, and that's about it. And the Spanish only comes back if I go and spend some time in a Spanish-speaking country, and then it starts to come back. But what you never lose, what I've never lost, is the expansion of my understanding and the richness that studying the literature and the history um, and, and the culture of, that came with those languages gave me. So even if you feel the French starting to slip, don't despair. Work to keep it but you'll never lose everything. Um, and I think sometimes that that opening of the mind is more important than the ability actually to utter a sentence in whichever language it is, and in Canada, the ones we care about are our two official languages. Question. Um, uh, you all have gone the route of becoming bilingual in Canada's two official languages, but um, not everybody does that. When I was closer to your age, um, there was, among a fair, fair proportion of the population, uh, the unilingual proportion, resistance to the notion that there was anything to be gained from learning French. Um, in fact, it was considered an awful imposition even to suggest that one might have to learn French, ramming it down our throats, they used to say. What is it like for young people now? This is coming back a bit to earlier questions. What are the attitudes now among the young people you meet who have not had your experience, who are unilingual Anglophones, who maybe stammered through you know, a couple of elementary courses uh, but really have no pretensions at all to speaking French? Do they? Do they feel defensive, hostile, indifferent, or maybe a little jealous? That would be what I'd like to hear. <laughs> um, so I, like I said, I went to a bilingual high school, so where there, there were many students who, were, who could only speak English. Mm -hmm. Everyone could speak English, but there were only a few of us that, that could actually speak both. So for those who were unilingual, um, it was, I would say they were not so much Hostile, but I guess that there was a, an aspect of jealousy there because they knew that once um, we all graduated, we wouldn't all have the same opportunities to mm -hmm. go to the same schools and to have the same opportunities. And um, they did know so that they, they did know they, that they, this they was an that. element of opportunity. Yeah, and um, it wasn't necessarily their fault. Obviously, like not mm -hmm. everyone started young. So um, yeah, I think there was more just an aspect of uh, longing. I guess yeah. I could say. I think I'm very surprised by the. Uh, extremes that people can, like the perspectives that they can take on this question. So for example, uh, some people would get defensive and they would think, why do I need to learn French? What opportunities are there? And then you speak with them more and they do recognize that there are many doors that open when you know both languages and you can tell them about your own experiences and they're, I guess I agree with the aspect of longing. They're thinking, I wish I could have done that. There actually are opportunities that open up and uh, there are people also on the other end who actually wish that their parents would have enrolled them in early French immersion. And um, I, I think I, I met several of these people at the University of Ottawa who saw me in the extended French stream and they were asking me, how did I learn French? And I told them about 
uh, my school's bilingual program and they wish that their schools offered the same. Yeah. Um, are those arguments that are persuasive when you're talking to unilingual people, um, the, the notion of opportunity, the notion of enrichment, if you will, and not, not just money, but intellectual, does that help? I, I didn't let you answer the first question, Mr. Andrew. I can touch on both a little bit. Um, so just going back to what you were saying on sort of the expansion of knowledge and, and learning both languages, how it can open the minds, um, I think that the reason that people, I would agree with you that sometimes there is that sense of jealousy. I think that the reason why is because while it's also opening your mind, it's also opening doors, mm -hmm. um, being bilingual. And I think that a problem with that is like I was saying, my parents chose to put me in French immersion. Although I'm appreciative now, I didn't realize how important it would be when I was in grade one, when I was six years old and they're putting me in French immersion. I didn't really know how important it would be. Um, and so in saying that, um, it's almost, like that perpetuating culture of, of the parents are deciding, if they decide not to put their, their children in French immersion, chances are it's because they grew up unilingual yeah. and they have that attitude that, oh, um, well, that doesn't matter. And so where I come from, sometimes there is that, that notion that um, this is an English area, we don't need to learn French. Uh, and it continues because it's the parents choosing to put the young people in. I think that attitude is sort of shifting towards young people. Um, and uh, sort of just going on the fact that, like I was saying, opening minds but also opening doors, and that's the important thing that I think that the, that the young people are seeing in terms of that. Um, I'd also just like to touch on Austin's point as well in that I think that notion of like not needing French sort of increases as we get older, so I found that in um, my later years of high school, even though a lot of us continued our French immersion programs, our teachers would speak to us in French, but we'd speak amongst ourselves in English. We'd share notes in English. We'd, we would you know, communicate in English. And from that point on, a lot of us started to dwindle and not really practice French as much mm -hmm. as well. I think mm -hmm. that um, with the op how a language can open your mind, it's very hard to convey that, um, yeah. that feeling, yeah. that notion to people who haven't experienced it. And again, with age, it's, just, it's, more, it's harder to understand the older you get. And if it's integrated when you're at a young age, you, you feel it for your whole life. Yeah. Thank you. Merci. Dr. Maltier, ensuite la sénatrice Mancion, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Si vous permettez, je vais avoir une question, une courte question. Chacun n'a pas la même question. D'autant plus que je suis ébahi. La sénatrice Fraser a posé ma question. C'est euh, vraiment, vraiment à marquer dans les annales du Sénat. <rire> Euh, je suis vraiment impressionné par vous euh, ce soir. Euh, des gens comme vous, c'est des gens qui bâtissent un pays. Vous avez l'avenir devant vous, vous la possédez dans vos mains. Vous avez le sérieux pour devenir des gens qui vont gouverner, qui vont certainement contribuer à bâtir et, et garantir la prospérité de notre pays. Austin, tu as été étudié à Nice. J'espère qu'on te montrait alors à prendre le pastis et à manger une bonne niçoise. Hein? Alors, tu as appris la langue de Provençal et non celle de Paris. Euh, ton expérience avec les Français, quand tu es arrivé là, quel était ton niveau de français et comment tu as été accueilli par eux? Um, donc, j'ai étudié à Nice en 2014 um, pendant l'été. Um, et quand j'ai arrivé là, mon français était, je pense que c'était Lucy qui a parlé de ça, qu'on qu apprend um, comment décrire en français, mais pas nécessairement comment de parler en français. Donc, j'ai resté avec une famille d'accueil et je suis arrivé là um, en pensant que, que j'étais bilingue. Et après <rire> la première journée, j'ai essayé de parler à mon famille d'accueil. Il n'avait aucune idée de ce que je disais. Um, donc, j'étais seulement là pour pour à peu près cinq semaines, mais euh, dans ces cinq semaines, c'est incroyable comment, euh, comment mon français euh, en conversation à, à l'oral euh, a pu améliorer. Donc, ça démontre qu'on qu a des, des opportunités hors du salle de classe, des opportunités de l'apprentissage expérientiel. Ça démontre que, que c'est quelque chose qui est extrêmement effectif euh, et je pense que je donne une majorité euh, de crédit euh, pour mon, pour mon français à l'oral, à mon expérience à Nice. Euh, J'ai aussi voyagé à d'autres parties de la France aussi euh, pendant des autres années. Et c'est ces expériences-là qui m'ont aidé à pouvoir être capable de parler à l'oral et non seulement à l'écrit. D'accord, merci. <rire> Christina, tu es de descendance roumaine, donc euh, le français n'est pas inconnu dans ta famille, puisque la Roumanie est la deuxième langue. 
je crois que c'est le français, du moins pour les quelques voyages que j'ai faits en Roumanie. Et euh, donc, pour toi, c'est une... Sans être une facilité, c'est un guide, une petite passion qui t'envoie vers, vers ça, parce que c'est quand même... Euh, toi, tu n'es pas, pas né en Roumanie, c'est sûr, mais euh, c'est vers ça que tu te diriges. Tu as dit quelque chose tout à l'heure qui m'a frappé un peu. Euh, à l'Université d'Ottawa, en sciences, c'était en anglais. Consulte-toi au Québec, c'est la même chose. <rire> Et demande-le à ma collègue, la sénatrice Fraser, euh, que ce soit McGill, Laval, Sherbrooke, les sciences. Les Français n'ont pas trouvé de mots encore pour les transposer. Et de là, le problème pour les professionnels européens francophones qui arrivent au Canada ne sont pas capables d'appliquer ce qu'ils ont appris parce qu'ils ne parlent pas l'anglais. C'est ça le problème d'adaptation euh, au niveau des immigrés. Mais je veux te féliciter parce que tu es une personne vraiment exceptionnelle de ce côté-là. Dans ton milieu, quand as-tu l'occasion de parler français? À By Market ou euh, juste <rire> sur le terrain de, de, de McGill? Um, dès que j'étais en première année d'université, j'ai... Euh eu des opportunités pour travailler dans des laboratoires de recherche. Et à chaque laboratoire, il y a au moins une personne qui parle en français. Donc, ce n'est pas une majorité, mais um, je vois the adversity that they have to overcome in their language, and they are forced to speak in English and to write in English and to read scientific articles in English. But within the scientific community, I would say, people are trying to publish in French, even though it's, I'd say, the, mo the more years that go by, the more they're pushing for science to be in English. And it's, it's hard to see, because these people have to make an extra effort to be heard in the scientific community. But I would say that they're still speaking in French, they're still trying, but I think that it is difficult to accept. But that is the, the way that things are going, is that science is being spoken more in English. Merci. Lucie, toi aussi, tu as des ascendances francophones. Euh, tes ancêtres viennent du Congo, tu m'as dit. Mm -hmm. Alors, euh, une partie, bien sûr, il y a le Congolais comme langue, mais il y a aussi une partie française euh, du Congo. Euh, moi, je voudrais te féliciter parce qu'on dit toujours que les immigrants ne veulent pas aller dans la communauté francophone. Et toi tu arrives dans un milieu totalement anglophone, tu décides d'apprendre le français. Tu fais l'inverse de la roue. Quelle oui. était ta motivation? <rire> euh, pour moi, ma motivation était vraiment ma famille, parce que pour moi, le français fait une grande partie de mon identité. Donc, si je ne parle pas français, mon grand-père ne sera pas euh, heureuse avec moi. OK. Comme vous savez. Donc, euh, euh, oui, c'est comme si j'ai du honte, de la honte si je ne parle pas français. Donc, euh, Okay. Ça, c'était vraiment ma, mon motivation. Dans ton milieu, euh, comment ça se passe dans ton, je sais pas, dans ton quartier, ta ville, ton village? Je ne sais pas où tu habites. Mais est-ce que tu as l'occasion de parler français avec tes voisins, tes copains? Euh... Euh, pas vraiment souvent parce que j'ai grandi à St. James et c'est vraiment un quartier anglophone. Donc, pour moi, toutes mes opportunités de parler français venaient de, de l'école, de, de, de l'école okay. secondaire. Okay. Vous savez, le... La vraie richesse d'une langue, c'est celle qu'on peut partager. Vous la partagez avec nous ce soir d'une façon exceptionnelle. Je vous félicite Merci. et je vous encourage à continuer. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Merci, Sénateur Maltais. Sénatrice Pension, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Je dois vous féliciter. C'est toujours... Euh, je trouve ça impressionnant de vous entendre. Puis ça fait plusieurs euh, jeunes comme ça qu'on rencontre, puis euh, qui ont des expériences variées, mais qui sont toutes euh, enrichissantes. Puis même avec euh, Parents for French, avec euh, tout le travail de, de, de promotion que vous faites, c'est quand même impressionnant parce que j'étais au déjeuner que vous avez fait sur la colline et puis euh, il y avait beaucoup de gens qui étaient là, puis la promotion des programmes et tout ça. Euh, ma question, puis la semaine dernière, euh, la sénatrice Gagné, le sénateur Cormier et moi-même étions invités comme panélistes à euh, un groupe, pour un groupe qui, qui, qui la Fédération canadienne des, euh, ou des communautés francophones et acadiennes. Et puis, une des questions qu'ils nous ont posées, c'était justement au sujet de la loi sur les langues officielles. Et ils nous ont indiqué que la loi sur les langues officielles n'a pas de mordant, 
qu'elle n'a pas de, de « doesn't have any uh, teeth ». C'est ça. Merci. Et puis, euh, fait, quand vous regardez, parce que vous semblez connaître quand même la loi sur les langues officielles, comment on la rend plus mordante Donc, je vais répondre à cette question en anglais et en français. Uh, donc, quand je t'ai demandé de venir de faire un témoignage ici, ici uh, je devais faire de la recherche uh, sur l'acte des, des langues officielles. Um, pour être complètement honnête, je n'avais pas beaucoup, um, ou, non, je n'avais aucun, uh, aucune idée c'était quoi l'acte uh, des langues officielles et si que ça m'a aidé uh, à devenir bilingue. Um, quand je l'ai regardé, j'ai fait de la recherche. Il y a certaines sections um, qui, qui ont évidemment uh, eu une influence, mais pas nécessairement une influence directe. Donc, je ne dirais pas que je suis bilingue en raison de l'acte des langues officielles, mais je ne dirais pas que ça n'a pas aidé à, à devenir bilingue. In terms of sort of giving it more of, of an impact, uh, it's doing essentially what the study is trying to do, to modernize it, to, to reach out to different demographics and to see their perspectives and their opinions and how it's affecting them. Uh, there are certain things Um, as you can tell from our, from our testimonies that, that we experience as young people, um, sort of the need to normalize French and English, the need to incorporate them in, in different initiatives and different services um, across the board and make it, make it sort of equal all across the country regardless of, of location, of age, of, of any demographic like that. Uh, so in order to make it sort of have that impact, uh, this is important. I think it's a good way to do it. But like I said, it's not necessarily something, to be completely honest, that I had uh, previous knowledge of, nor did I, do I think that it is the reason I became bilingual, but there is definitely ways to sort of give it more of a, more of a punch and have more of an effect. Do you have any comments? And even, even for you, Nicole. Si j'ai la permission. Merci. I think that, that in working with the LAFCFA, uh, on travaille quand même souvent ensemble, et c'est certain qu'il faut avoir un respect pour la communauté minoritaire francophone. Mais c'est difficile parce qu'on doit leur expliquer, de dire vous avez besoin d'alliés. Et les alliés, c'est les anglophones francophiles. Euh, alors, il y a toujours cet aspect de rapprochement et appréciation. On ne veut pas embarquer comme anglophone, francophile, puis on s'en vient en gang, puis tout à coup, on sent qu'il oh, ben, va y avoir une assimilation qui va se faire. Mais si les portes sont trop fermées, puis dans certaines régions avec la FCFA, c'est comme ça, les alliés se sentent toujours re rejetés. We get sent back. So, yes, I want to go to you have a festival, a French movie festival, and I want to bring my immersion students as a teacher. I want to go as a family to watch that French movie. C'est pas toujours apprécié, les portes sont pas toujours ouvertes. Parce qu'ils disent, ben, vous allez venir ici, vous allez parler en anglais. Yeah, that might happen. But they're still appreciating the French film. They're still supportive and open, and that's what we talked about. It's not just communicating in French, it's being open to the French culture and the French language. Alors, des fois, nous, de notre côté, on doit comme un peu expliquer, comme ouvrir les portes, laisser la chance aux deux d'interagir. Puis pour notre organisme, c'est un des, pro des problèmes qu'on a, c'est plus d'interaction avec les locuteurs natifs. On ne peut pas les convaincre de continuer à apprendre et de se pousser s'il n'y a jamais de personnes de l'autre côté qui vont les écouter. And that's our challenge, is finding that. So if the modernization of the act can add some teeth, It's around ways where, you know, francophiles need some rights too. They need rights to services en français. Pas au détriment des francophones. Les francophones en premier, I get that. But making sure that francophiles who want services in French can also demand them. Not just say, well, we'll use them if they're there. And I think by getting that number, the large majority of anglophone allies, using them, It's going to protect those francophone services. It's going to make them be available in more rural anglophone areas because those French immersion graduates will say, I do want to use those services. But right now they have no, no recourse to demand those services or to have more places in a French immersion school. When you hear that there's only one high school that has a French immersion program, we have 390,000 students enrolled in French immersion. 
The popularity and demand for parents, we could have 500,000 tomorrow for you. Well, if you had 500,000 kids learning French immersion, there'd be even more you know, uh, demand for those services. So it's been by the cuts and the caps on enrollment in French immersion. It's not that the demand for pa from parents and kids is not there. It's the schools, and you use the term, don't see French immersion as the norm. It's still an optional program. And so right now in, Francophone, uh, in, in the Vancouver School Board, they're getting ready to cut some uh, kindergarten spaces. They're cutting the immersion kindergarten spaces. Why? Because the immersion program is an option. They don't have a right to that program. So, you know, I guess that's the biggest thing that we come back from Canadian Parents Religion. It's about having a right as Francophiles to your fr uh, second official language. In Canada, if we're really a bilingual country, each of our communities should have a right to their second official language, not taking away from the importance of the right for les minoritaires, but as on our back, it's a, it's a complementary right. Mm -hmm. And I think then all of the services would get used more, and les minorités would feel themselves much more supported. I do have something, sorry. I could add something onto that too that, that you made me think of. Um, I'm not 100% sure, correct me if I'm wrong, we were sort of discussing this earlier, um, but in terms of sort of having the divide between Anglophone, Francophone, and sort of do you consider yourself bilingual? Are you an Anglophone? Are you a Francophone? Are you actually bilingual? And there's sort of that divide as well, and that's also an issue when it comes to finding those allies, because as someone who would like to consider themselves bilingual, I always wonder, am I actually bilingual? Would I be welcomed at those French events and things like that? Whereas someone who is in French immersion and is trying to learn French uh, would consider themselves likely an Anglophone, trying to get to the stage of bi being bilingual, um, but would again, wouldn't feel welcome there. So there's that sort of divide between what is an Anglophone, what is a Francophone, and, and how what is actually considered bilingual. Um, and also that, that goes off to what Christina was saying about how it needs to be part of an identity. But if you're identifying with sort of those things, but we don't really know exactly what it means. Um, in New Brunswick, it means something different if you're bilingual in New Brunswick than in BC, where French is, where it's, where it's less common. So there's sort of that divide um, nationally as well with what is considered Anglophone, Francophone, bilingual, et cetera, as well. Thank you. Uh, Madame Thibault, I just did want to say that um, this has been two reports, the Aiming Higher report, as well as our most recent report on access to French immersion programs in British Columbia, where we've stressed the importance of having access partout et pour tous au programme d'immersion française. Alors, le comité uh, sénatorial des langues officielles <laughs> reconnaît l'importance d'un accès partout et dans toutes les régions pour les Canadiens qui veulent apprendre uh, cette langue officielle dont est le français. Alors, euh, voilà. Euh, Sénatrice Meji, s'il vous plaît, pour euh, le dernier premier tour, euh, et ensuite on recommence un deuxième tour. Alors, je joins ma voix à celle de tous les autres sénateurs pour saluer votre enthousiasme et votre détermination pour euh, vouloir porter le flambeau du bilinguisme comme vous le faites. Mais j'ai appris dans les branches avec des, des collègues, moi, je, euh, qui, donne, qui essaient de donner des, des soins en français dans certaines régions, ils ont fait un constat, c'est qu'ils ont remarqué que des personnes immigrantes viennent dans leur bureau, ils ne savent pas les français, mais ils ont peur d'en parler et ils parlent en anglais. Et ils sortent de là, pas avec les bonnes informations, parce qu'ils n'ont rien compris de de ce qu'on leur a donné comme information. Je sais, toi, Christina, tu t'en vas en médecine. Comment tu penses pouvoir détecter ça? Parce que tout le monde, on travaille. Les heures passent, on voit un patient, on s'en va. Ou celles qui ont un bureau. Au bureau, les gens vous posent des questions, mais ils se forcent à parler anglais, mais ils ne le savent pas. Mais ils ont peur parce qu'ils disent, « Ici, on ne parle qu'anglais, donc je parle anglais. » Y a-t-il un moyen pour vous, dans votre milieu de travail, de, de le sentir, puisque vous, vous aurez peut-être développé une certaine sensibilité? Je ne sais pas, je n'ai pas la réponse. Je vous le demande. Y a-t-il une façon de le sentir et de dire, hum, « il me semble qu'il ne m'a pas compris, je vais essayer le français, voir. » I think the first thing is letting them know it is okay to talk to me in either French or English and I will respond in the language that you desire because 
as a future doctor, the most important thing is the comfort and trust of your patient. And um, I noticed this year in uh, my program, Translational and Molecular Medicine, that there were some francophones and I would speak to them in English and see them hesitate and try to speak in English with me, but it's, it's something that you pick up on quite quickly, that they're not comfortable in that language and you can switch. If you're able to switch easily, it really helps with the foundation of a relationship. So I think that the most important thing and with this challenge in uh, my future practice is just letting people know that I am going to be able to speak to them in both languages and that they should feel at ease communicating with me in any way they see fit. Puis ça peut être déjà arrivé peut-être dans un autre milieu qui n'est pas de milieu de médecine, là, entre vous autres, des gens qui veulent vous adresser la parole puis vous sentez qu'ils ne sont pas... Euh... Sometimes that happens when people are asking for directions. <laughs> ah, OK, OK. Oui, yeah. oui. Ouais. OK. Puis Lucie, as-tu une idée euh, peut-être dans ton nouveau milieu de travail ou non? I think it's really important to get away from English as being the default. So I think many of us find that we um, have to use English first um, in many of our, you know, conversations. Even when you go to a place that's bilingual, they may start with English and then and then French as a, as a second option. So I think it's important to just welcome the two in a way that's that's presented simultaneously, so that people have the opportunity to speak whichever language they desire. I would also, so yeah, I would also yeah. agree uh, agree with them, and it also goes goes back to the point that as um, Anglophones who are learning French, we're also in that situation sometimes, um, going asking for directions, and we'll try to say it in French, but we get responded to in in English because they can tell that person's an Anglophone. They're not actually they're not actually able to be to, to sort of communicate in both. So maybe we'll have to give them their answer in English just in case they won't understand. So that goes back to the whole um, concept of normalizing both official languages, and as you mentioned, um, sort of there's the whole aspect of, of immigration and welcoming people here. Well, which language do they actually do they actually learn first? Is it English? Is it French? And, and why isn't it both? If we're actually a bilingual country, and specifically in New Brunswick, if we're actually a bilingual province, it should be both. And that way you get away from that um, miscommunication, that breakdown in communication when it comes to asking for directions and getting medical services, and the list goes on and on. Voilà. En tout cas, le Canada peut compter sur vous pour euh, <rire> contaminer le reste des jeunes comme vous. Sénatrice, euh, euh, sénateur Cormier, suivi de la sénatrice Gagné, s'il vous plaît. OK, I, I want to speak with you on identity and security. And since I understand really well the insecurity you talked about when you speak French, I will, I will express myself in English even though I come from a French community, the Acadian Peninsula in New Brunswick, and I, although I learned English at school, I didn't have the opportunity to speak English, even though I'm from the only bilingual province in Canada. So, and I want maybe to, my questions concern the four of you. In your, in your vision, you, you're talking about a Canada where linguistic and cultural duality is an integral part of daily life. And I want to understand better the difference you make between duality and bilingualism. For me, and I'll give this explanation, as I want you to, to react to this. Of course, we're talking about duality, it means that we recognize that both official languages communities need their spaces where they can have public spaces in their own language, so their culture, their identity can flourish. And at the same time, we're talking about bilingualism. We're talking about the fact we need to, to, to have more, more interactions together. And uh, Christina, you said if, if French become part of, our, of your identity, you don't want to lose it. So my question is this one. What does it mean for you, your identity as a francophone, as a French speaker? Like, you know, like being bilingual is a linguistic competence. We sometimes never link that to culture, really. So what does it mean, that identity? That's my first question. And the second one is, how do you define the challenges that we see 
bilingualism in one and duality. What does it mean? Because I, I hear both of that all the time, and I, I don't know if people distinguish one from, from the other. So thank you for you. Yeah. Euh, moi, je vais répondre en, en premier. Euh, C'est certain qu'on parle de dualité linguistique, bilinguisme. We, we say them a lot, but what does it really mean? Um, I have two daughters, and they are their age, uh, a little bit younger. Um, my daughters go to francophone school. Moi, je suis ayant droit, là, alors oui. my children go to a francophone school. But their father is an American anglophone. So, of course, they see themselves as bilingual. And um, when someone says to them, oh, you're English, they'll say, oh, no, I'm bilingual. And when they say, oh, t'es francophone, and they'll say, no, no, je suis bilingue. For them, it's just the way they see themselves. And when they meet their Anglophone families, they'll say to them how different my children are from their other cousins. Because there's been a component that's been part of their daily life, whether it's the food they eat, whether it's the TV shows they've watched, it's the experiences they've had. Um, they just don't know any other way. And when they're with francophones, they'll often say, and they'll say the same thing to me, is, oh, t'es vraiment l'anglophone. T'es es tellement anglophone. Mais je pense que j'ai quand même un, un accent correct là, en français. Mm -hmm. Mais tu es tellement anglophone. And it's because my mother being from Dublin and never speaking French can never come out of me. That's just, I have expressions that are Irish and I have expressions that are so anglophone that I'm different. Je pense que c'est ça. C'est de voir qu'il y a du, de l'additif à notre euh, identité. Il y a des, des choses qui sont complémentaires, puis il y a des choses qu'on ne peut jamais enlever. C'est un peu comme vous avez dit, même si je, je ne parlais pas la langue, vous ne pouvez pas enlever le français de moi. Euh, J'ai une ouverture d'esprit un petit peu plus libérale que mes amis anglophones, un peu plus conservateurs. There's just differences between English and francophone, English phones. Um, I grew up in Quebec, so I have certain Quebecois-isms, you know? Uh, when I meet someone who's, mes filles ont appris le français en Ontario, ils ont un accent franco-ontarien. And people don't think that I'm their mother quand on parle en français, because I have an accent that's different than my children. Alors, je pense que c'est un petit peu ça, c'est que je ne peux pas vous répondre la question, c'est quoi la dualité linguistique mais c'est tous ces aspects-là, c'est l'aspect de culture, de la vie, les expériences, euh, qui est encore plus que juste linguistique. Um, and then bilingualism, to me, is more l'aspect linguistique. It's being able to express my ideas uh, in both languages. And what I've had a problem with is people get upset because I code switch. And code switching is, je commence une phrase en français, puis je la termine in English, and I don't know I've changed languages. And so translators hate me. Um, but it's because I just grew up learning both languages, and so I take whatever word comes to my mind that fits best. Tu sais, le mot débrouillardise en français, there's not, that word doesn't exist properly in English. It, and so you just, when you speak about that, and I'm giving my children a hard time, I say, like, let's do that, even if I'm speaking them in English. Alors, je pense que c'est un peu ça que eux, ils voudraient vivre. C'est cet aspect où both languages are an integral part of your daily life, and it's about the language, but it's also about your living experiences. I don't know if that helped start you off, or? I can touch on it a little bit. Um, just, it's essentially what you said, uh, sort of, I was writing notes as, as you were going along and basically writing exactly what you were saying. Um, but in terms of duality and, and bilingualism and the separation, I also consider, so duality sort of being able to work together but having those independent cultural and social practices. So for New Brunswick example, having the um, Acadian Peninsula uh, with the Francophone culture and then having the area that I come from, Salisbury, with that Anglophone culture. Um, and that would be duality because they're both living in New Brunswick. Um, but bilingualism, that aspect is being able to converse and to sort of integrate them while also having that, that social and cultural independence um, and sort of I would say the whole aspect of New Brunswick is bilingual. Eh, it's not necessarily because we don't have that ability to all communicate in both languages, but we do have the linguistic duality because there are both. Um, so 
the actual step of becoming bilingual will be, will be able to integrate them while also keeping their independence, but being able to converse in everyday life and being able to, to switch from French to English, just like that, and sort of having that normalization of, of, uh, of the languages, but while keeping the distinct cultures and societies. <coughs> I would say that that's definitely the definition of uh, duality with like trying to integrate but also really maintaining uh, se like separate cultures and not feeling, I, we wouldn't want minorities to feel like we're ensconcing on their territory, if you will, like it's, it's something that is very, they hold true to themselves and we want to be a part of it, but there's also like the duality is respect and acceptance, but also we understand where the limit is, whereas bilingualism like, uh, they were saying is just the ability to converse in both languages, the ability to feel comfortable speaking with people in English or French. And when I say French is part of my identity, what I mean by that is that without it, I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't have had half the experiences I've had. So that's what I personally mean when I say it's part of my identity. I think in a way that I think that it's easier for them to converse with us in English. So there are times when I go over to Gatineau and whenever I need um, services in English, whoever is serving me is more than likely will serve me in, in English because um, I find that being in, in a minority group, you sort of have to push yourself to um, express yourself in the other language as well. But as Anglophones, because we're not always so rounded by the other language, we uh, find ourselves less likely to converse in French. So what, what, have you, have what do you think should be done to increase bilingualism and at the same time to, to have those, that duality, those communities, strong cultural communities in, in different languages? How, what would be the priority for you, priorities? Um, je pense qu'on devrait, comm devrait commencer avec l'éducation, um, malgré le fait que c'est une priorité ou, ou une responsabilité provinciale. C'est encore quelque chose que le gouvernement fédéral devrait travailler um, en partenariat avec les provinces. Um, si je vais ajouter au point de l'OCI, um, en tant que les francophones ont une habilité uh, plus... Je dirais, ils sont plus capables de parler avec les anglophones. Uh, c'est similaire au Nouveau-Brunswick. C'est parce que dans leur uh, système d'éducation, um, c'est presque... Um c'est presque requis d'apprendre le français. Donc, ils ont leur cours de, ou d'apprendre l'anglais, je veux dire. Donc, ils ont leur cours en français, mais ils apprennent leur deuxième langue. Um, tandis que dans les, dans les systèmes anglophones, si, ce n'est pas comme, ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'ils doivent faire. Les étudiants ne doivent pas prendre les cours en français. Donc, Je pense que si on commence avec ça, um, d'intégrer uh, le, des programmes d'immersion dans les provinces comme le Nouveau-Brunswick um, pour pouvoir avoir plus de jeunes qui parlent les deux langues, éventuellement, ils seront eux aussi capables de communiquer avec les francophones dans leur deuxième langue, dans leur langue seconde. Et uh, éventuellement, ça retourne à qu ce qu'on disait plus tôt, à, à la normalisa normalisation des deux langues, um, mais ça doit commencer avec l'éducation et ça doit commencer avec les jeunes. Les étudiants adorent les prix, donc il faut aussi euh, acheter des, des bourses et des, des opportunités où on peut comme, gagner un prix, de, où, comme nous, nous avons participé au concours et il y avait comme des grandes bourses pour euh, assister aux, aux universités um, autour du Canada. Donc, ça, c'est quelque chose qui, que, that you guys can think of as well. Merci. Alors, Merci on va, beaucoup. On va passer à la sénatrice Gagné pour la dernière question à la sénatrice Bowie. Euh, merci, Madame la Présidente. J'ai euh, la, la loi sur les langues officielles devant moi, puis euh, peut-être Austin, étant donné que tu as fait un peu de recherche à ce niveau-là. Non, mais je, ça, ça sera pas, ce n'est pas une question piège, je te le promets, mais la partie 7, puis tu en as fait euh, mention tout à l'heure, euh, c'est que le gouvernement fédéral s'engage à favoriser l'épanouissement des minorités, euh, euh, des minorités francophones et anglophones du Canada et appuyer leur développement ainsi qu'à promouvoir la pleine reconnaissance et l'usage du français et de l'anglais dans la société canadienne. Un petit peu plus bas, on, quand on parle de la mise en œuvre, on dit que le ministre du patrimoine canadien prend les mesures qu'il estime indiquées pour favoriser la progression vers l'égalité de statut de l'usage du français et de l'anglais dans la société canadienne et notamment toutes mesures, alors il y a A pour les minorités linguistiques, puis après ça, B pour encourager et appuyer l'apprentissage du français et de l'anglais. 
Alors, quelles mesures additionnelles est-ce qu'on devrait ajouter? Est-ce qu'on pourrait peut-être penser pour justement donner un petit peu plus de mordant, comme la sénatrice Monsion disait, pour justement assurer qu'en tant que francophile, vous pouvez avoir accès à l'éducation dans la langue officielle de votre choix? Um, donc, je peux parler à, à ce rapport un petit peu. Um, donc, je dirais encore que qu'il doit y avoir plus de partenariats avec les provinces, parce qu'il y a certaines provinces qui ont un avantage um, à comparer à d'autres. Donc, on, ici en Ontario, on a l'Université d'Ottawa qui, qui, pour la majorité, um, avec l'exception de certains programmes, uh, peut être compété avec les deux langues, le français et l'anglais. Tandis qu'au Nouveau-Brunswick, il n'y a pas nécessairement une université qui est bilingue. Il y a des universités anglophones et il y a des universités francophones. Donc, encore, ça, ça, comme avec le rapport de ces sections, ça donne l'opportunité d'apprendre les deux langues, mais pas ensemble. Donc, le, le gouvernement fédéral doit travailler avec les provinces pour pouvoir intégrer les deux et donner des opportunités dans les deux langues, um, donc à ces universités, d'avoir des cours en français et, et des cours en anglais. Donc, ça retourne encore à de l'éducation. Ah, mais comme je pense que c'était Lucy qui l'a dit, peut-être, non, c'était Lucy qui a dit les choses comme des bourses, c'est encore, c'est important, mm -hmm. ah, mais il doit y avoir des autres opportunités aussi avec des choses hors de la salle de classe, telles qu'avec des, or, des organisations um, incluant Canadian Parents for French, um, les organisations que vous avez entendues la semaine dernière, Expérience Canada, Français pour l'avenir, je crois que c'était, um, des choses comme ça, parce, parce que ça aussi, c'est important. Les expériences hors de la salle de classe, des expériences expéri, expériences doit être inclus dans les législations telles que l'acte des langues officielles. Merci, Austin. Euh, vous avez mentionné, Mme Thibault, euh, la collaboration que vous avez avec l'Association des collèges d'universités de la francophonie canadienne. Puis, euh, je me suis posé la question à savoir si vous croyez que les collèges et les universités euh, s'adaptent à la réalité, justement, de la clientèle francophile ou des finissants qui proviennent des programmes d'immersion française. Est-ce qu'ils ont réussi à s'adapter à cette clientèle? Ils s'adaptent présentement. Alors, vraiment, c'était eux qui disaient qu'il y avait des difficultés. Ils sont venus à l'avant dire qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire. Et nous, on a, on a, le protocole est avec l'ACPI, qui est les professeurs d'immersion aussi. Alors, on travaille parents, professeurs avec eux, avec les programmes. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour créer des, des programmes de soutien, du mentorat? Puis c'est eux-mêmes. Alors, oui, la réponse est certaines institutions sont plus avancées que d'autres. Et certains, l'Université d'Ottawa a quand même une grande structure. Mais l'Université Sainte-Anne fait beaucoup, beaucoup d'efforts d'activités pour faire le rapprochement, l'interaction entre les francophones et les francophiles et pour les aider en salle de classe. Campus Saint-Jean, ça fait bien longtemps que eux, leur, euh, le, le nombre d'étudiants francophiles euh, aide à, à garder les grands, plus grandes classes. Alors oui, on, on est là. Est-ce qu'on a toutes les réponses? Pas encore. Euh, mais je pense que c'est les, les interactions avec les, les locuteurs natifs qui sont difficiles. Alors même pour eux sur le campus, ils vont vous dire il y a des clubs, il y a des activités, mais est-ce que tout le monde participe? Ça dépend. On est stressé, on a beaucoup de cours. Euh, tu sais, alors, pas tout le monde qui va participer non plus. Alors, il faut que ça vienne assez à un point où ce n'est pas juste des choses à part, mais que c'est intégré dans leur tous les jours. Comme ça, ça on n'y pense pas. Euh, alors, quand Asseline a dit un peu les échanges et les visites culturelles, on voit comme de l'aspect comme prof, euh, les jeunes vont prendre des cours, ils vont apprendre le français jusqu'à un certain point, mais quand ils ont eu une expérience de l'immersion, alors, tu sais, un, un camp d'été, un cinq semaines, les cours euh, faits par le CEMEC, euh, Explore, des citations clics, etc., c'est ces expériences où ils vont comme surmonter euh, la, 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 la limite, mm -hmm. puis là, tout à coup, ils peuvent converser et être beaucoup plus spontanés. So it's, it's getting past that threshold that all those programs really do help. Merci beaucoup. Centrist Bovisi. I just have uh, one quick question that um, really adds on to what we've been talking about between the uh, Canadian, Can Canadian government and provincial relations. And I want to, Lucy, go back to Winnipeg for a minute. Being from the only school that has French immersion in St. James, we know there's several in the Winnipeg School Division, there are others in Louis Riel. Was there any interconnection between the three school divisions and uh, uh, with you as students? And if there were cultural activities that could come in from other parts of the country, 
uh, could those school divisions get together and do something, or are the school divisions so divided that it's like three different programs and others, I mean, sort of in, in within one city? Yeah, um, I, def I definitely found that there was a huge divide um, between the French immersion schools and the actual francophone schools. So mm -hmm. in Luriel, we found that there were like many fr uh, francophone schools and they sort of had their own cultural identity and their own way of doing things. And then when you would go west, where I'm from, um, we were really just limited to learning French in the classroom, and as soon as the bell rang, it was done. So you didn't connect with Calvin High School or? Oh, absolutely, or, no. Or, uh, <laughs> because I think that's another problem in terms of, of, of connections, where you've got mid-sized, larger cities that are divided into multiple school divisions, and they're divisions, right, instead of connections. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Avant de terminer, moi j'aimerais vous poser une question. Vous avez parlé de l'importance de normaliser le français, de normaliser les services en français. Quel genre de service aimeriez-vous avoir en français dans votre vie de jeune adulte? Um, I would just like to see sort of a greater emphasis on oral communication, because like I said, I found that um, following the basic French. But now, oh. in, your, in your young adult life now, what kind of services oh. would you like in French now? Um, oh, I guess it's any sort of services, I guess. Um, yeah, bank services, anything like that. Um, we could definitely um, use more services in French. Je pense que c'est important um, d'avoir tous les services en français et en anglais parce que ça, ça nous donne le choix. Si quand si qu'on nous rend um, au poste pour renvoyer uh, une, une lettre, on peut parler en français ou on peut parler en anglais. Um, au Nouveau-Brunswick, um, on est pas mal chanceux parce que la majorité des services publics, donc les banques, les services postaux, um, la majorité des magasins, um, tu peux avoir les services en anglais et en français, um, mais hors du province, ça c'est l'aspect du bilinguisme néo-brunswickois qui, qui fonctionne, uh, mais hors du province, uh, je pense que c'est important d'avoir tous les services en français parce que, encore, ça normalise les deux langues, ça donne des choix et ça donne aussi la chance des, uh, des anglophones qui apprennent le français et les francophones qui apprennent l'anglais, la chance de pratiquer. Donc, je pense que c'est important d'avoir tous les services. I think this may seem a bit silly, but at the end of the day, when you just want to relax and kick back, obviously something wonderful would be uh, equal French and English on the radio or on TV, so that it's not only normalized in a professional environment, but also when you're at home, when you're relaxed, I think that would be amazing as well. Okay. Senator Maltier. C'était le rêve de Madame Chaput. J'attends après la sénatrice Gagné, toujours sur S9. C'était le rêve de Mme Chapu que dans tous les endroits au Canada, on puisse avoir des services bilingues. Vous avez totalement raison, Mme Gagne. Quand aurons-nous cette chance? Alors, c'est une, une question que je n'ai pas posée, mais évidemment, euh, pour recevoir certains services du gouvernement fédéral maintenant, il faut satisfaire à certains critères, donc avoir... Euh, 5 de la population dont la langue première est le français. Cela exclut les finissants des programmes d'immersion. Mmh. Cela exclut les, par, les, les, les jeunes de familles exogames. Cela exclut des immigrants, par exemple, pour qui le français est la deuxième ou la troisième langue. Alors, pour vous, recevoir des services où vous ne qualifiez pas serait important. Je faisais une, une leçon, <rire> une leçon pédagogique. C'est bon, vous n'avez pas besoin de répondre, mais, mais je voulais, je pense c'est ce que vous me dites, finalement. Euh, c'est ce que vous me dites. Alors, je vous remercie. Au nom du comité sénatorial des langues officielles, euh, nous vous, on, on vous remercie. Je pense que vous pouvez voir par les commentaires des sénateurs que, que vos témoignages nous ont inspirés. Nous avons apprécié votre enthousiasme. Uh, you are very articulate. You are very wise as well. And, and uh, we appreciate the time that you took to, to you know, bring forward your very constructive comments and, and your suggestions, which will be very helpful as we move forward on our study. And if you have any further thoughts, please do not hesitate to, to send them to our, our clerk. Uh, we will appreciate them. And as I said, bonne chance, bonne chance. Je sais que vous êtes déjà bien parti dans vos carrières, dans vos études. Continuez, s'il vous plaît, à chercher ces liens. 
de ces relations pour pouvoir continuer à ne pas perdre le français parce que je pense que c'est toujours avec une certaine tristesse que nous, que nous témoignons du fait que vous avez fait tellement d'efforts et maintenant. Mais je retiens les mots de sagesse offerts par la sénatrice Fraser qui dit « on ne perd jamais tous, il y a toujours cette appréciation de l'autre culture ». Alors, merci, Mme Thibault. Merci à Canadian Parents for French pour tous les efforts que vous faites pour faire valoir euh, le bilinguisme, la dualité linguistique de notre pays, qui est fondée sur un, 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 un pacte de la Confédération, finalement. Et, et, et merci à vous de faire valoir cette, euh, cette partie importante de notre identité canadienne. Alors, avec cela, je déclare la séance fermée.